Hello, everybody. I'm Captain Jim Palmer, the Dream Business Coach. I'm the founder of the incredible Dream Business Mastermind and Coaching Program, creator of No Hassle Newsletters, which is a done-for-you newsletter program used by over 1,200 small business owners. I'm also the host of Dream Business Radio, the weekly podcast created to help you build your dream business. This is episode, easy for me to say, episode 574. I have a very special guest today, Marty Strong. Marty, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Captain. I like, I like saying that. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> uh, anyway, I'm, I'm really excited for our conversations. Let me get this out of the way real quick. Hey, folks, this episode of Dream Business Radio is brought to you by the Dream Business Mastermind and Coaching Program. If you're an entrepreneur who wants to grow a more profitable business faster, become an in-demand brand, especially if you're looking to create multiple streams of revenue, you want to be part of this extraordinary virtual mastermind led by me, Captain Jim Palmer. You can learn more at dreambizcoaching.com, dreambizcoaching.com. All right, let me introduce Marty and we will Thank dive you. right in. I've, I've been super uh, excited about this interview. Most of the people that come on, I've, I've met like two months ago, so I've been really looking forward to having Marty on. He is He has been a leader for decades. First in uniform as a combat decorated Navy SEAL, and then in commercial business. Marty's a thought provoking speaker, uh, keynote address. He does some really um, high end speeches for corporations, large and small. He's also been a guest expert on over 350 appearances on, on cable TV, hundreds of radio and podcast interviews. And um, he's also the author of the amazing book, Be Nimble How, to, How the Creative How the Navy creative SEAL Mindset. Wins on the battlefield and in business. So once again, Marty, welcome to Dream Business Radio. Yeah, thanks for having me, Jim. So first of all, I'd love to get into the backstory a little bit. I, I, I always ask my clients, so when did you become an entrepreneur? Did you did you go through uh, law school or did you become a CPA and go, don't want to do that? Let me go start. <laughs> let me go start a carpet cleaning business. Or you had a obviously a much different route. Did you go into the military right out of high school or what, what was those early days? I did. I went right, right in after high school. I was 17 years old. And uh, when I went through uh, SEAL training, I think I was 18. The, um, the, the big, I guess, takeaway from not so much just the military, but the SEAL experience is that unit is very innovative, very creative. And back then, we never said the word entrepreneurial, but it's very entrepreneurial. It, mm -hmm. um, not just the unit, but sometimes the, the tasking that's, that's sent to a unit like the SEALs is uh, seizing an opportunity, a window of opportunity that there is not a clear answer, a clear set plan. They expect you as the operators to figure out how you're going to perform, how you're going to execute, how you're going to do it. Soup to nuts playing, and sometimes you're doing it while you're running towards an airplane or flying towards the, the target. So yeah, that's why the, the word nibbles in that book. You have to be very agile in your thinking. You have to be very uh, much on the balls of your, your uh, feet all the time. And that's how they train you. That's how they select you. And eventually, if you do that long enough, you get pretty good at it. I don't know that I one's know that more than the other. It's probably both. But I mean, my experience in talking with a couple other folks who went that high level, it's it's as much about the mindset as obviously they train the heck out of your body, right? You have to endure some some serious stuff in training. But they're really they're really training the mind too. Is that correct? Yeah. The, so the misnomer is, and it's it's I get it. The media wants to show things that are really cool. So they want to show, you know, the, the movies and the TV shows. They can only show the action. They can't show the long process of trying to turn somebody into a great planner or a creative thinker or an incredible leader. Everybody would appreciate it if they were in the moment, but it takes too long to try to show that. So what mm -hmm, you get is you get mm -hmm. a cartoon kind of caricature image, very shallow, one dimensional. And in reality, as you just said, the physical part, you have to be physically capable to even get into the basic screening course. So you're already a, an athlete, right? Then, they, then they pound you with physical training to get you to make decisions between your ears. One is a means to the other. The end is, can this person, do they have emotional maturity? Do they have psychological resiliency. When push comes to shove, are they going to become a lone wolf? Are they going to, they going to work with the team? Uh, are they going to give up early? These are the things we're trying to elicit with the physical part of the of the uh, training. And by the time you get to about halfway through the, the initial uh, six month course, you've got who you've got. They're all, maybe they're a little bit of raw material in a lot of different ways, but they're definitely psychologically and mentally intellectually what you can work with from that point forward. 
so you've obviously been through a lot. How long were you uh, in the SEALs? Are you allowed to say that? 20 years. Okay. 20 years. And then I think you told me right before we went live, you've, you've had a lot of, uh, well, probably during that 20 years, but you, you've had quite a lot of uh, edu formal education as well. I know that you've been through some serious stuff, we'll say. I know you uh, tragically lost your son. You've beat cancer twice. <laughs> Phenomenal. Phenomenal. And, and, and as, uh, as I read in your bio, you've been shot in a few exotic countries. So Shot at. Was, oh, yeah. shot at. Oh, okay. Yeah. I missed that. Okay. Thankfully, so, I haven't been shot. In a lot of so you learned how to duck. Okay. <laughs> Not to make light of it. But um, and then so you're a retired Navy SEAL officer, combat veteran. How did you, when you got out, how did you say, I think I'm going to go speak to CEOs and, you know, become a high level coach? What was that transition like? Well, the first thing I did was I, I decided to get into financial services and I joined a company in Baltimore as a, uh, essentially at that time they were called brokers. Very quickly, they, they converted the whole um, business model to a financial planner, kind of a state planner, um, high net worth kind of a thing. It was thus about the transaction of just selling a stock to somebody or a bond or a mutual fund. And I was, uh, I didn't know anything about sales. I had to learn from scratch. I never walked out since I was a kid or maybe it was a you know, boy scout or cub scout. We did paper drives and sold light bulbs. That was the only experience I had in retail sales. Now I had to walk up to strangers and ask them to give me their, their life savings. Mm -hmm. So that was a huge learning curve. That was an eight year process. Uh, after two years, I went to work um, doing the same job with the uh, United Bank of Switzerland. So then I was a portfolio manager. And most of my high net worth clients were business people. I would say 70% of them were self-made business people and 50% of them didn't have college education yet. They were multimillionaires. Wow. So it was kind of like the Napoleon Hill thing. I was sitting there, you know, hypothetically at the knee of these people that had gone through bankruptcy multiple times that had all kinds of different business experiences. And now they were like battle hardened wizards, you know, and they're telling me mm. these stories. And I heard that for eight straight years. So that was, that was a great way to kind of add to my leadership and training and just general life experience and education uh, from the time I was in the military. And it really prepared me for the next period when I went into corporate uh, leadership, both business development and uh, different kinds of program management. So Somewhere along those lines, um, I learned how to talk to people that are concerned about the future. To talk to people about their own business models because there's lots of different businesses from car dealerships to restaurants, etc. I learned a lot about the mechanics and some of the basic truths, both of being an owner and of running a company. And I knew a little bit about the funding and the finance side of it. And so that was just kind of a natural segue to helping people uh, through coaching and mentoring on uh, on all those topics. It's interesting your analogy to Napoleon Hill. Did you know who he was at that time, or did you now? Did you sometime later figure out who Napoleon Hill was and go, "Wow, that's kind of like what I did back there." I think I probably read him when I was going through my undergrad, and okay. I was when I was about twenty-three. And I probably read wow. um, "Think and Grow Rich" a couple of times over my life, but that was the first time I think I was exposed to it. Yeah. But the concept, the concept of. Uh, practicing intellectual humility to walk up to somebody and say, I don't know very much, but I'd love to hear how to do this. And I'm just going to be all ears and then shut up and let the, let, let the, uh, the muse, you know, hit you with all the reality. And so what he did is a very smart way for anybody to get really smart about any topic uh, that they don't understand. And whether you think you're an expert or not, you should always seek out wisdom that way. It's, it's a good model. So you have um, you have these two business books I'm going to talk about, and you told me you're about ready to launch third. But I also read, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you've authored like eight or nine nonfiction, I mean, uh, fiction books, novels? Nine, yeah. Oh, my gosh. W when did you do that in your spare time? <laughs> and was that like a passion? You just, you're a good storyteller? I'm curious about that. I, you know, I'm a pretty good storyteller, but, you know, it doesn't. You can you know, start tell a story over a beer, which all, <laughs> by the way, all seals or green berets or most Marines are really good at telling a story over a beer and telling it well. Um, part, partly because we have a lot of content <laughs> through all the experiences and everything. Yeah. But the uh, there's a big difference between that and trying to get the discipline to actually put, you know, 90,000 words on paper and have it organized. So, um, I 
started writing in 2017. I started with a novel. It was a time travel book. I thought it was going to be a one-time shot. Um, I decided to donate donate all the proceeds to the SEAL Veterans Foundation, a program they have that helps with PTSD and uh, traumatic brain injury. I liked the process. Um, it was published. It did real well. I liked that too. So I decided to write a second one, um, all as a series it, it, as it turned out. So I wrote four of the time travel books over the course of about five years. And I started writing uh, a second series, which were SEAL, a SEAL narrative and uh, taking a very young officer through a kind of his lifespan almost from brand new to in the fifth and final book last year kandahar moon he was uh um probably 43 years old and and a lot of that was knowing what happens to to, to seals and leaders and their learning curve but also how the the, the job beats them down physically and at, at some point you just can't keep up with the young kids it's kind of like the nfl you know Mm -hmm. You keep you keep showing up, and after the seventh or eighth year at camp, you're two steps slower than you were, and somebody That's else is right. going by, and then you're like, uh oh, yeah, yeah, kind kind of like Aaron Rodgers just figured out I'm I'm not as young as I used to be. I mean that that's a very sad. Uh, you yeah. know, Astro turf. I don't want to go down, but you know, you get to a certain point. I don't know. Just as a fan, I'm like, it's time to retire. <laughs> I don't want to see you know your your plateau, and then you kind of go downhill. But I don't want to go down that rabbit hole anyway. Um, so your expertise and your passion today, Marty, are, are like leading dynamic organizations of which I think you own four companies yourself. You write the novels. You've written two business books. One is Be Nimble and Be Visionary. Um, you know, a lot of times uh, people that I interview, they're, they're very accomplished. And they do all these different things because they don't like doing just one thing. Is that is that like you? I mean, you, running four companies is no small uh, task, but then all the other right. stuff and going out and giving keynotes and things. Is there something you like better than others or is it all just the, the big pie? So the I don't own all the companies. I'm just the CEO of all those companies. I own my own consulting company. Okay. Um, I, I like to, to make a difference. I like to influence events. I like to make things better. So in a lot of cases, like some of the companies that I'm the CEO of, they started out very small. So they were very uh, interesting projects. You know, the the one is a healthcare company we bought with one employee. And mm -hmm. now it's up like, you know, 178 people in, in multiple wow. states and everything. So, um, but there's a point there when you, when it needs to have its own leadership and I have to appoint a president. And now, you know, I may have built the Ferrari. I don't get to drive it anymore. Okay. So, so there's a, so there, you know, there's a same thing with the books. I mean, you write the books and, and you get to say the novels and you get to a point where at the end of the first draft, you, you just had this great cathartic experience and you're really happy with the way it turned out. It all came together. And then you're like, now what, how do I get that again? How do I get that high again? We write another book, right? Yeah. So one thing kind of leads to the other and you get a certain, I mean, trust me, the, the editing process and going back and forth, the publisher, that's not fun. The marketing isn't necessarily fun. But to me, the writing's fun. So I think I'll keep writing until the day I can't write anymore. Mm -hmm. um, the coaching and, the, and the, the speaking has just been kind of part and parcel of my life since I got out of the military. I mean, I was a, I was a spokesperson in the SEAL teams. Uh, I ran around as kind of the, like the talking head, giving briefings and things like that to uh, – three and four star generals. And, you know, and I, I was selected for that because I was articulate and I could stand up and I could make a good, good showing. Right. And I could also handle the questions without um, coming across uh, too crass or, or, or dumbfounded or anything like that. So I had a lot of practice at that. And I think I did the first one about three years after I got out where somebody, I went and did the, did the presentation. And then afterwards, somebody kept, shook my hand and said, Hey, how much, what's your fee? I go, what? You know, and I go, well, what, what do you want? So then I, then I tried to look up how much do people charge for this? <laughs> <laughs> but, um, cause I didn't charge for the one he watched. Um, yeah, I, you know, I thought, hey, what the heck? Somebody wants me to get up in front of a bunch of people and talk, I'll do it. So it, it's evolved over time, but that's also enjoyable. The, the pr presentation, the prepping of it, uh, let's say you and me, you want your organization, uh, it's going through something or it's, it's an annual meeting, whatever, but you as the, the buyer of a, of a speaking uh, service, I want to know what, what you want to do. Do you want to invigorate them? Do you want to, you want to um, 
scare them? Do you want to fire them up? Whatever, whatever you want to do, right? You want to educate them. And then I have to create that solution. And then if you say, man, you just, you just hit the bullseye on that. And then I know when I present it, it's, it's going to deliver what you're asking for. And that's, that's a challenge too. It's a smaller package, but yeah, they're all different challenges, but that's what I'm kind of looking for all the time. So uh, like I said earlier, you know, did you realize at the time you were doing kind of what Napoleon Hill did or you look back. So all the things that you've done now, you know, CEO of several companies, you're, you're going in and, and you're doing keynotes, motivational, you know, speaking and things like that and your own coaching business. Do you realize now how much of your uh, military training has influenced that? Was that, or is that always obvious? Like, man, I've got this skill set. I'm speaking in front of generals and stuff. This is what I should do. It wasn't obvious. Like my education was uh, business, undergrad in business and a graduate degree in, in management. And none of that applied to managing money. I wasn't in a corporate environment. I, you know, I was selling. Guess what? They don't teach selling in college. So I had this, all this education and I couldn't apply it. What I found out I could apply though was giving seminars. So I built my business initially by giving seminars on things like estate planning and all that. And because it was something I was already comfortable doing and it worked for me, that was the marketing approach that worked. Then when I got into corporate management, corporate leadership, suddenly that education was applicable, but I had no experience at doing it in a business or a corporation. So it was all book, it was all book uh, learning and, and not all of it applied. And actually most of it didn't apply. So I had to learn, I had a learning curve all over again. And back to the Napoleon Hill thing, I had learned by that point, if I don't know how to do something, go find out whoever is the best at doing this and just ask them questions until they kick you out of their office, or whatever. So whether they're in the company or they're outside the company. So, um, you know, he, Napoleon Hill talks about the mastermind, you know, having, right. a, having a community of people and you can, that's great. Or you can just seek and create a, a community of one for a short period of time. It, it, it works. You just have to, you just have to kind of leave your ego at the door and walk in and be open-minded like a six-year-old and just take everything for what it's worth. And then it's, then it's a great value. Yeah. yeah. In your book, in your book um, uh, be nimble, how the Navy seal mindset wins on the battlefield and in business. I know you emphasize humility as a key element of success. Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, I, I've kind of codified it. I, I didn't talk about it so much in this way in either book I did in the, in the third book that will be coming out um, next year. The three, the three steps to kind of creativity for me is the first thing is intellectual humility. So you basically have to cast aside all your, your recent um, re experiences of being rewarded or, or patted on the back for doing well, or your recent defeats, because both of those things will color your ability to take in new information or your willingness to take in new information. That clears the deck so you can go to the second step, which is intellectual curiosity. And in a pure sense, that means seeking information from any and all sources, not just the people you know, not just the people that have a title next to their name for that subject, but you know, webinars, seminars, people in, in restaurants that you find out happen to be in a business that is adjacent to yours. And the third step is intellectual creativity. And I think that third step is achievable, and it's what you would apply to almost any business problem you can think of. Whatever challenge you come up with, this three-step process works. And you can really be truly intellectual, intellectually creative if you've done those first two steps. If you ignore the first two steps, you're closed-minded and you've got all this baggage. Like I know the football play that worked 10 times in a row. I'm just going to apply the football play. That would be not being humble and just saying I'm a genius. Or I'm scared to make a decision because I failed three times in a row. You see, they those are both things that affect your willingness to do something completely different. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I was looking at the table of contents of both be nimble and visionary. I want to ask you about th three chapters just briefly. So one caught my attention, the 85% rule. We're all familiar with the 80, 20 rule. What's the 85% rule? <laughs> well, and it, it really, I think it's probably almost to a 75% rule these days. So think about the speed of design, development, innovation, deployment, and the idea of rapid prototyping of, of both ideas and even um, products. The reason those things have become popular in the last, you know, let's say five to six years 
is that if you sit there and try to make something perfect in your wood shop, you try to make something perfect in your factory, if you try to sit around on a whiteboard with a bunch of people and agonize over making your idea, your business model, whatever, perfect, hmm. what usually happens is you go, all right, we're ready. You step out and you find out that five other people leapfrogged you, four of the companies already put the product out, and, that, and you were asleep at the switch because you were so focused on getting everything just exactly right that you missed the moment. You missed the opportunity. So there's there's a shelf life that maybe in the industrial revolution was a five year, 10 year period where you could sit around and tinker and mess around and test and all that. Cause there weren't that many people and, and the speed wasn't really an issue nowadays, whether you're a pharmaceutical company, a tech company, even if you're a restaurant, you want to, you want to buy a perfect piece of land and then you hem and haw and guess what you look up, you know, 20, 20 days it's later, six months, it's gone. Somebody bought it and put a gas station there. So that's, um, that's really what I mean by that. You, if you can get to the 85% of what you're trying to accomplish, and I'm, uh, this obviously does not apply to skydiving equipment or brain surgery. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's yeah like you 100%. need 100% there. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> but, you know, you have to have the, um, the courage and the, uh, the kind of the poise in the moment to say, okay, guys, I think this is good enough to go and let's tweak it and let's take feedback from the team, let's take feedback from the street, feedback from our clients, whatever, and make it better and better and better. But meanwhile, we're working on the next best thing. And that way you've got a little bit better shot at staying ahead of everybody else's learning curve and production curve and and uh, and go to market curve. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, so another chapter which caught my attention, the black swan. What is the black swan? Well, there's actually uh, a black swan is an event it's, a, it's a, a term that um, means an event that you didn't foresee coming that had devastating effects. And, I, and I'll give you an example. Um, somebody asked me about the same question. And they said, can you give me an example? Well, well is, is the COVID-19 pandemic? It's obviously a black swan. And I said, no. The government's reaction to it was the black swan. Because we've had an, uh, um, pandemics in the past. We've had global pandemics. Mm -hmm. and I could list a bunch of them, but we've had them in the past and we never shut down everything. We never, you know, locked kids out of school. What was unforeseen was not that someday there might be an epidemic or a pandemic. What was unforeseen was that governments would shut everything down mm. because that had never happened. So, except for maybe in a science fiction movie when, you know, aliens attacked. So that was a true black swan event. Um, there are black swan events that happen in small business medium-sized business, privately held businesses, every single solitary day. The ones that you can actually analyze are the ones that happen in publicly traded companies because people document them, they write books about them. So there is a book called The Black Swan. I can't remember the author off the top of my head, but if you look at The Black Swan up in Amazon, you'll find it. And they've categorized and they put in you know, all these examples. And then they basically what I try to capture in the book is what their lessons learned is from that, from that experience of studying. And that is, Pretty much everybody after a black swan event in an industry comes out in three different lanes. There's those that thought that it was going to go away. So they basically put their hands over their ears and their eyes and went, wah, 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 and just hoped it would all go away. Um, and everything would go back to the way it was. The second, third are people that um, procrastinate a little bit, kind of do that, that denial thing, but they only do it for maybe a month and then they realize, okay, Things have changed. We got to come up with a, a new way of doing things to survive. And then the third, uh, one third, are those that, within hours, get everybody in a room and say, "The world has changed. We now we have to reinvent ourselves." Mm. And there may be opportunities here. Let's think about this. And they rebuild their company. They rebuild the products. They rebuild whatever their teams. And in their in the studies of these black swan events, that last third tend to take over sixty percent of the market in the next four to five years. They basically eat up and buy up that first third that went in denial because they basically just keep heading towards the cliff and never change anything. So it, it ask, actually, a black, black Swan is an opportunity for that third group and, and it's a disaster for the first group. Okay. I want to ask you about a, a chapter in your book, Be Visionary. Um, one of them is called Confidence, Charisma, and Humor. Confidence and Charisma, totally understand. It's about leadership. What is humor doing in there? 
Well, I, now I definitely learned this in the military. And the thing about the SEALs and any special operations unit, they're constantly testing you by running you through scenarios all the time. I mean, it's pretty much your job is to constantly be doing mission impossibles and, and, uh, and most of the time you don't do a real good job at some component of it. Maybe it's just the way our psychology is set up and maybe it's part of our psychological resilience that they pick out in the selection process, but rather than get uh, depressed or dismayed, we think it's funnier than hell. Um, we have to hold our tongue until the, the exercise or the mission's over. But afterwards, man, we're all over each other, you know, and it's very <laughs> um, good natured. And we know, OK, it, what, what goes around comes around. So this op, you're the guy that screwed up, got the batteries, whatever, you know. And the next op is going to be me and I'm going to take that. I'm going to take the the, uh, the the beating. But if you get a bunch of SEALs of any age, of any era, I don't care what if they're Vietnam or Desert Storm or, you know, Afghanistan, if you get them in a room, get them drinking some beers, it will be a nonstop funny story fest that, that won't oh. end until the beer's over. And the reason I added it to the book was because as a leader, if you think about it, let's say there's a black swan event, let's say something goes wrong. Um, there is a textbook kind of military stereotype. You just show no, no concern, right? You stand there blank faced, nothing's affecting me. I'm a rock in the middle of crisis. That's fine. But, you know, it's really more effective than that is if you basically give a little half smile and you see a little funny element to it and you look at everybody in the eye and you, with a little, little twinkle in your eye and you say, well, this is what do you think? This is you think we're going to get out of this thing? I know we will. But, man, this is going to be fun. You know, and you kind of and you lighten it. they are looking at, well, the boss doesn't seem to be freaking out. Yeah. And he's not acting. He's not acting like a leader under pressure. He just looks like a person that's taken it in stride and he looks like he's confident. And so you put all that together, you know, confident, the charisma, the charisma is part of the humor is fed into the charisma component. And, uh, and you, you are perceived, especially when things, when leaders are needed, when things are going wrong, you're perceived as somebody who's taking it in stride and you're open-minded and you're going to figure out a way to get everybody through it. And that is a great combination, I think. Wow. What a great answer. Everybody ought to, you know, the audience that has been listening to me for 10 years, entrepreneurs, small business owners, people trying to grow their business. Um, what a phenomenal answer. I got, I got time for one more question, Marty. I know SEALs are known for their ability to handle stress. You sort of just described that. What advice do you have for small business owners that are dealing with any, you know, maybe there's a black swan, maybe they're just trying to get their new client and pay their rent and pay themselves. <laughs> you know, what advice do you have for, for those people who are stressed out? Well, the first part of that advice would be it's not going to go away. Uh, I don't care if you're the head of a multi-billion dollar corporation, you're going to be stressed. Uh, I saw a quote the other day that, that anxiety is basically just all of us anticipating and actually experiencing the the pain of the future that we anticipate is going to be coming. So we're putting ourselves through a fight or flight process uh, emotionally when we really don't have to. You know, the stress is is the stress that's happening in the moment, and like we just talked about how you can handle that. You know, calm your heartbeat. Consider that everybody's watching you and looking at you and wondering what you're how you react to it. You're a leader. Let's figure this out. What I what I said to my people is uh, let's work the problem. You know, it's kind of like a right stuff movie quote kind of thing, but let's work the problem. Let's get into a room. Let's get some paper. Let's find a whiteboard. Everybody likes to get their hands busy and their brains busy when things are bad like that. Leaders should take that if it's a stressful moment. But as far as future stress, I think planning and what's not taught in schools very well is modeling out all kinds of different outcomes. Mm -hmm. Because what you're doing is you're you're de-stressing by demystifying. If everything's unknown, then everything seems like it's going to be a negative. But you can, again, sit down. Let's work this thing through. What if we went this way? So it's path A. Boom, 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 boom. What's what's good about that? What's bad about that? Okay. Write some stuff down. Okay. What if we did it a different way? How if we this, did, did it this way? And by working the problem and then projecting it out as scenario planning, kind of storyboarding, what you do is you're taking charge of the future and you're making it less of an anxiety exercise and more of a management leadership exercise. 
Yeah, and, and as it's being in action. It's solving the problem, considering the options, and, and then deciding and taking action. What a fascinating interview. I could talk to you for another half an hour easily, but clock dictates all. So first of all, Marty, on behalf of the entire Dream Business community, thank you for your service. It was a wonderful interview. How can people uh, connect with you, and where can they get your books? Well, books are on Amazon.com, but you can also go to MartyStrongBeNimble.com. It's access to all my articles and my books and all that. And it is. I did go there. As you know, I, I check out blogs. I look at books when I prepare for interviews. There's some really great, cool blog posts I didn't get a chance to ask Marty about here, but what a great interview. Marty, thank you so much. I greatly appreciate it. Thank you, Jim. Hey, folks, I really recommend you connect with Marty, get his books. I mean, what a fantastic interview and um, obviously quite a leader. You can connect with me at getjimpalmer.com. And uh, remember, if you're interested in uh, joining the uh, Dream Business Mastermind, that is dreambizcoaching.com. You can get a free copy of my latest ebook. I think this is number nine now, which is how to uh, create your own virtual mastermind. You can get that at lucrativevirtualmastermind.com, lucrativevirtualmastermind.com. Remember, as part of my legacy building program, all of my books are available for free in digital format. So they're Nook books at Barnes & Noble. They're in the iBook store. And their Kindle version is obviously free on Amazon. But that's it until this time next week. Another fantastic interview. I am Captain Jim Palmer, the Dream Business Coach, and you take good care.